here we go. It's four o'clock, my four o'clock on a Friday, my favorite part of the week. Uh, why is it my favorite part? Because it's research with relevance and we are starting our third semester of bringing to you some great uh, researchers and research projects across KSU. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Phaedra Corso. I'm the Vice President for Research at KSU um, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I think we're going to have a pretty, pretty good show. Um, just to remind you why we're doing this. Um, unfortunately, we're still in a pandemic. We were kind of hoping that we would be past this by now, but hold on just a little bit longer. Um, but this was our way of trying to keep all of us connected um, across both campuses during a time period where many of you are working uh, remotely or coming to campus very occasionally and so it was our way to to try to stay engaged as a community of researchers and, and we think this um, platform this format has worked out really well and we just want to keep it going um, even if the pandemic goes away we may still continue with this format with some slight variations um, I know we've got a few deans on on the um, call today and I will tell you that for the for this semester, we have I think six or seven faculty who are presenting. We're doing a few uh, fewer episodes this semester than we did last semester, but this fall I'm hoping to feature all of our deans. Wouldn't that be fun? So for those faculty out there, make sure you give a little nudge to your deans so that we can learn about the great research that um, that they've done. So a few housekeeping tips before we start. Um, the first is to please make sure that your mics are all muted when you're not speaking, which I think everyone has done. I think we're pretty used to Teams by now. Um, the second is if you want to focus on a, a specific speaker, if you click on the three dots next to the person's name, then their face will um, will show up uh, quite large for you to focus in on them. And then finally, just to let you know, we are recording this session. Uh, these recordings have been very helpful for a number of reasons. One, we post um, the videos up on our YouTube page um, and we use these videos for recruiting students to KSU and we encourage you faculty and colleges to also use those videos for your own recruitment purposes. So our schedule for the next hour is we will start with our normal format, which is we'll start with a video. And uh, today we're featuring Laura and Richard Ruhala and Lance Krim. And then we will follow the uh, video with a, a live interview live. We're all here. We can see their faces um, and then we'll open it up to questions um, from the audience and you can send your questions in through chat and I would be happy to read your questions or if you feel comfortable raising your hand or just. Just coming on into the conversation is fine with me. So um, so let me go ahead and introduce our speakers today and a big, big thank you to them. Uh, I will tell you that um, we put out a call to see who is interested and sometimes um, if, if when someone says yes, we don't have a whole lot of time to get prepared and, and I will say that Laura and Rich jumped in and said we want to be the first ones and so we're super, super enthusiastic um, about you all joining us. So um, let me introduce them. So Laura is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and Richard is a professor a professor of mechanical engineering. They are from Flint, Mi Michigan and worked at General Motors for several years and we'll learn a little bit more about them when we see the video. Uh, Laura received a PhD in engineering science and, me and mechanics. Richard earned a PhD in acoustics both from Penn State. They joined Southern Poly in 2010 and very importantly were two of the founding members of the mechanical engineering program and I'm going to uh, ask them to tell us a little bit more about that when we get uh, when we get to the question answer stage. Um, and since then they have collaborated collaborated on numerous projects focusing on medical devices and the mechanics of football related injuries. Um, joining the Ruhalas is Lance Krim. Lance is a professor of electrical engineering and he's joined Southern Poly in 1997 uh, after working many years in the computer industry. Um, he served for 10 years as the founding department chair in electrical engineering when the program began in 2009. Uh, he has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech and he is a licensed professional engineer in Georgia. And since playing the piano and we don't have his video up or at least I can't see it, uh, he is sitting in front of his piano. So this is a, a very nice view. Yes, thank you for that. 
Uh, Lance's research interests include the physics of music and acoustics, as well as studying music technology applications in electrical and computer engineering. So I think this is just a great example again of research with relevance uh, that we're showing. So with that, um, we don't have Heather here today. She's on maternity leave this semester, so a big um, congratulations to her. But we have uh, Joelle here who will play the video for us. Thank you. I'm looking, sorry. This is the high stress portion of the hour. <laughs> it is. So we'll just uh, just hang in there, Joelle. You can figure it out. OK. Oh, here it is. Oh, wait, let me try one more time. All right, I got it, I think. Hi, my name is Laura Rahala, and I am an associate professor of mechanical engineering. Hello, my name is Richard Rahala, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. We are both faculty in the Southern Polytechnic College of Engineering and Engineering Technology. We are from Flint, Michigan, and have been married for 29 really happy years. I received my Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Kettering University in 1991. And I received my Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Michigan State University also in 1991. After working at General Motors for a number of years, we left to pursue our doctorates in engineering at Penn State, where we graduated in 1999. My PhD is in engineering mechanics. While my PhD is in acoustics, we came to Southern Polytechnic State University, now KSU, in 2010, and we were two of the founding faculty members for the mechanical engineering program. In the beginning, there were just 35 students in our new ME program, and today there are over 1,600 students and 25 full-time faculty. Rich and I very much enjoy collaborating on our research. Hi, I'm Lance Krim, and I'm a professor of electrical engineering in the same college with Lauren Richard. I joined Southern Polytechnic State University in 1997 after working for several years in the Apple computer industry, following undergraduate and graduate degrees at Georgia Tech. I teach primarily in electrical engineering and served for just over 10 years as the founding electrical engineering department chair when our program began in 2009. I have been passionately playing piano since a very young age fostering my later interest in the physics of music and acoustics, as well as studying music technology applications in electrical and computer engineering. During 2020, we all experienced the speech sound changes when wearing face coverings to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. This included faculty and students who are teaching and learning in face-to-face -face classes. Laura and I have been friends with Lance for over a decade. In addition to a love of Game of Thrones, we also share an interest in acoustics, and we had fun doing sound measurements of Lance's piano. Last summer, the three of us decided to work together to study the acoustic transmission of face masks and coverings. During fall semester 2020, we developed our own testing method in a classroom on campus. To keep the acoustic or speech sounds as consistent as possible, we used a head and torso simulator, or HATS, which has the head and torso dimensions of an average adult and has speakers inside its mouth and nose and microphones inside its ears. We used white noise, artificial speech, and recorded speech files to evaluate 14 different face masks, shields, and combinations. With the help of two amazing KSU undergraduate mechanical engineering students, Anahita Hajimarazai and Andrew Pierce, we collected over 130 recordings and data files. Thus far, we have been able to evaluate the data involving white noise, which evaluates a wide frequency band that encompasses speech sounds. Our data show that cloth and paper masks reduce sounds above 1500 hertz by as much as 12 decibels. 
Considering sound power doubles every three decibels, this is a significant decrease. And this frequency range above 1500 hertz affects some vowel sounds and many consonant sounds, such as the S in state. Clear plastic coverings for face shields and some face masks cause something unexpected. In addition to the now expected sound reduction at high frequencies, they amplify the sounds near a thousand hertz, thereby causing a real speech distortion. We are in the early stages of understanding this, but believe it to be caused by a mechanical resonance. We tested many masks that were also tested at Duke University for droplet transmission. The goal would be to select a mask that is excellent at reducing droplet transmission while also having a minimum impairment of speech sounds. Of the standard types of masks that we tested with white noise, the surgical masks appear to have the best overall performance. Cloth masks have a wide range of acoustical performance, while the 1000 Hertz amplification for face coverings with clear plastic is something that needs more research. We are seeking external funding to continue and expand this research to include a listening study. By procuring a hat to KSU, we can record significantly more voice samples and thus determine the effects of face masks on speech intelligibility. Test subjects will ascertain and distinguish the words and phrases they hear in this listening study. We expect this research to be relevant even after COVID-19 subsides, since we may see our Western culture continue to utilize masks when a person is ill, such as been the case in Asia, or possibly when the next pandemic might occur. Okay, great. Thank you. That was uh, Lance playing there at the end, so I wanted to make sure we didn't cut it off too early. Um, really, really interesting research. Uh, such a great example of research with relevance. Uh, my goodness, um, I, I'm just so so excited to talk to you about this. So um, I'm just going to, I know we've got a bunch of questions that we kind of said we were going to talk about, but um, I listened more closely this time to what you all had to say. And, you know, obviously you were motivated to do this because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but have you done any work like this in the past that would have um, led into your ability to just jump in so quickly during the pandemic? I, 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 we didn't talk about this before, but it just seems to me like you were able to flip that switch and go into this research so quickly. And so I guess I wanted to understand how did you, how, where have you been previously to the pandemic? I think probably the most relevant research that um, that Rich and I did was on um, vuvuzelas. A vuvuzela is a horn that's used in South Africa, and um, before the uh, was it the London Olympics, there were there was a consideration of banning these horns, and so Rich and I uh, got a series of vuvuzelas and we tested them acoustically, and we found out that if you're sitting behind somebody who's tooting on this vuvuzela, it is deafening. I mean, like literally deafening. Um, what do you think, Rich? Do you think that's the, I think that maybe was our most recent experience? Yes, definitely. The, that was an, an experience that uh, helped us launch this. Also, um, my days a while ago when I was, uh, after I got my PhD, I worked at Lucent Technologies, which was, previously part of AT&T and, and with Bell Labs. And uh, I got exposure to some of the really great acousticians and acoustics research going on at Bell Labs and had used this head and torso simulator, the fact the same model. So I've had experience with this equipment before. And so that made it easier to know, okay, what, what equipment do we need to do this? Um, and also can, you know, a way to do it without having people involved. I mean, a, the later research, we can get real speakers and compare it to the uh, head and torso simulator. But to get to do, get our testing off the ground, do, to do this pilot study, uh, that that background, um, that experience really helped us get going right away. And I think so another, another thing that comes to mind is what Dr. Corso mentioned about the research Laura was doing with the hair and helmets and football. It was real relevant and she was able to use that and seeking funding. 
Yep, yeah, good. Thank you. I was going to ask you, um, Lance, have you all collaborated previously? I mean, uh, you know each other because you've been working uh, to, you know, in the same same place for a long time. But but how did this collaboration come together? Well, it mainly came together because I invited them over to my house to watch some of the ending episodes of Game of Thrones, <laughs> and I had arranged song and they wanted to hear it. We've really just been friends uh, in two different departments in engineering over the many years and share that love of music and we did that and that's what made us interested in them coming back and measuring different sound measurements on the piano. Mm -hmm. So um, you know I, we we met earlier this week and we talked about a couple of questions but honestly uh, I, my mind's going in a different direction and so I, if I throw things at you that we're not quite prepared for let's just wing it. Um, so I think of all the episodes that we've had so far, you know, the title of the show is Research with Relevance. I mean, my goodness, you are in the midst of a pandemic and you're doing research that really matters. So how do you, how, like, what are the steps to get this research out there in a timely way in the midst of a pandemic? So where are you in that process? Well, we collected data in the pilot study um, in uh, three but about 30 hours of data collection in November and December. And then we worked through the winter break on analyzing the data. And um, uh, and then we have a paper that is mostly written and we're hoping to get at that out no later than the end of the month. It's about 80% ready. And, um, and then and that's just one bit of our data. And then we're also working um, on data, analysis. Rich, you have um, a, an undergraduate student working right now on data analysis from a different location in the classroom. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have a student, Danny Hernandez, who's doing a directed study, an undergraduate uh, mechanical engineering student. Uh, and so now we're looking at, we also took measurements, uh, what we've, what we've presented now today and what's going in our first publications are at a two meter distance. So we want to get kind of the direct acoustic field. But then we also have one, um, it's about six meters. We're kind of in the last row uh, or second to the last row of the classroom off to the side. And we wanted to get what's the effect of all the room acoustics, uh, all the reverberation and, and sound attenuation and that effect and how is that going to affect uh, do we get different results uh, at that distance? Uh, so that's one of the things we're we're looking into next. So you know, I think of all the people we've featured, you all are working on a problem in real time um, that I imagine there's many other people across the globe who are doing something like this, right? So how do you how do you beat the crowd to get this out into the into the peer reviewed literature? Like what? What does that look like? And do you do you have contacts in your field across the country that that you can talk with about, or is it just trying to like beat them to it to get it out into the literature? I see it as a more of a beat them to it, um, and we've you know never worked so hard, frankly, over a winter break than we did this year, and um, and I think that that's the type of thing that we absolutely need to do, and we just need to really burn the midnight oil. It's a matter of getting out there first, <clears throat> and then there's also um, there's a conference coming up, um, a deadline, and uh, Acoustical Society of America, and that is going to be a natural place to uh, to publish as well. And we're you know we're keeping our eye out because. Um, uh e even if there is uh, there are other publications that emerge on the topic which i'm positive there will be there's going to be a lot of interest in acousticians on this topic um so even beyond that um i still think that our you know probably everybody looks at the problem from a slightly different angle at least that's what i hope <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to say too that um, the resources at Kennesaw State University were really helpful in getting launched quickly. Uh, speaking with Dr. Bill DeYoung was very helpful in our college, and then also with Dr. Corso, who recommended some grant requests to NIH that we hadn't considered. We did submit a, a, 
a grant request to the Sloan Foundation. And so we are looking for external funding to continue the listening study we want to do in the future. Yeah, great. Um, I have a, a whole host of questions that I can ask you, but I, I do want to, I can see some questions that are popping in on the chats. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions. I see Rich, you've already responded to one of them, um, but uh, here's a question. I don't know what GOT is. Game of Thrones. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that just shows that I live in a cave. <laughs> and I liked, I don't know, I liked the last season more than others did. So I'll just put that out. I want to put that on the record. It was okay. <laughs> I might be the only person in America who never saw one episode of that show. <laughs> but that's, that's a different that's a different research with relevance show that we can talk about. Um, <laughs> all right, so let me... Um, I love that you that so much of the work that you all have been doing while you've been uh, at Southern Poly and and now at KSU has been with undergrads. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about the undergrad involvement in this project and then maybe we can and if you want to reach out to them and ask them to participate in that response, that would be great. Yeah, Anahita, Andrew, Danny, are you guys here? Um, we had three, two undergrads that helped us with the data analysis. And um, Anahita had had Jimmy Rizai and Andrew Pierce. Anahita was a um, she was a graduating senior, but she wanted to get more uh, research experience, so she volunteered her time. She also worked over. She was also able to work over the winter break to help us with some lit review. And Andrew Pierce was equally important. Um, helped us so much with the data collection and the files. We had 130 files of data that we uh, needed to manage. And then Danny is working with us now, and he's doing the work that Rich referred to earlier. He's looking at the six meters out. But um, Anahita, Andrew, Danny, are you guys here? Oh, Anahita says, I'm here. I can say hi. Hello. Um, sorry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just protecting my, you know, webcam. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll ask you a question, Anahita. What is, um, what's the most interesting thing that you've learned doing this research? Um, I think I really like the hands-on experience, um, like assembling the dummy together and like um, having to see like what you put together and then what it takes to actually get data. I think that was really interesting for me. Excellent. Um, the your others, uh, come on, come on down, Andrew and Danny. Let's hear from you too. There they are. <laughs> All right. So, what is the most surprising thing that you've learned? What do you tell your friends at a cocktail party? <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Not a cocktail party. Just a regular, good Coke and chips type of party. <laughs> what do you tell? What do you tell your friends that you've learned? I mean, I, I could talk if no one's going to talk. Um, just today I was at the um, grocery store and like I was saying something and the cashier was like, what? And I was like saying it again. And I don't speak really loudly either. So with the mask, it made it harder. So I had to keep leaning in and he was leaning in. So I guess I learned that, wow, you know, masks do really affect the noise. And so what type you're wearing really affects like the speech. And how, okay. you know. Excellent. And to that point now, so we're hearing from the CDC this week that they're recommending that we all double mask. So thinking about all the research that you've just done with one type of mask, and I love that you had a different, you had a variety. What are the potential impacts for us to be double masked? Well, I think that absolutely needs to be investigated. And um, I'd like to get the hats back and uh, do, you know, it wouldn't take that long, just do some testing with a variety of combinations of, um, I've heard a, a very fitted mask and then maybe a cloth mask over the top of it. And um, we could we could get the hats quickly and that's the type of thing that we could turn around so fast. And, um, you know, it's an issue of, you know, burning the midnight oil, but we could totally do it. We just need to get the hats back. And, um, and we've talked about about doing it um, because I think that uh, you know we're gonna find it. It's it's much worse. I know the last time I was out was at a doctor's appointment and I had 
um, I had a CN90, uh, KN95 with a um, uh, cloth mask over the top of it. And I felt like I had to shout like Anahita was saying. And, and will you all describe, I know you did in the video a little bit, but kind of the difference in distortion between the different kinds of masks? Sure. Yes, Rich, sure. you want to take this one? Okay. All right. So we sort of expected that there would be uh, attenuation because this is like a very thin wall because you think of it as, okay, this material is like a very thin wall between the source or the speaker and the receiver, the listener on the other side. Um, so we expect it. And also we thought, okay, at higher frequencies, we expect to be more, more loss of energy. And that's what we saw with the paper masks and the cloth masks. But then when we tested with the face shield and some of the plastic uh, masks that had a clear plastic for the mouth area, which is great for reading, you know, reading lips and it can help improve speech intelligibility just by having it, your mouth open uh, and visible. But we found an amplification there at around a thousand hertz and that was unexpected. So we believe this is a, a resonance that's happening and it's something we need to um, really investigate more to, to understand that. One of my, um, my best friend from high school, Lauren, Lauren Stinson, her daughter, Emma, is uh, hearing impaired. And over the summer, I was talking, Rich and I were talking to Lauren about, about Emma and how difficult it is for her with her speech impairment uh, she she relies on on reading lips a lot, and she relies on reading lips even more than anyone realized. As I think a lot of us rely on reading lips more than we initially anticipated, and so we had this special mask um, for for those especially with hearing disabilities, and it's like a regular cloth mask because it it has a little piece of plastic where the mouth is, and I think you could have problems with it fogging up and stuff, but. But not on our not on our hats because it didn't have breath coming out. So we tested that, and we were um, we were really shocked by the distortion that that little piece of plastic was causing in what was otherwise just a normal um, cloth mask. But but shout out to Emma, she's doing great despite um, you know her, her complication with reading lips due to masks. So I think you've answered one of the questions that just came in that says, I saw some masks that were partly clear. Do you think that would help? And it sounds like you're saying that that's ca causing distortion. Yes, it was actually worse. It was it was bad at the high frequencies like like all masks are, but it was it was like amplifying around a thousand hertz. And what that's going to cause is, is this distortion. Yeah, that was that was really we we. I don't know, I guess maybe we hadn't thought of it beforehand, but that was kind of a surprise to us. And that's actually one of our largest findings is that is the um, the the complication that you get with plastic. Mm -hmm. um, I think you make exciting research so exciting is you find things you're not expecting, that you're involved in the research and something you weren't expecting actually shows up. I call it the Louis Pasteur moment because he was studying, you know, chicken not thinking about how to do homogenization or pasteurization just the fertility of chickens yeah that's that's a great example lance and i can imagine that there are so many different permutations of what you're studying that are are worthy of publication and and dissemination to the world and it's just going to be you don't have enough hours in the day so you're going to have to really just pick off what you can do all right there's a couple many questions coming in uh will you be testing a dummy with a mask in combination with a face shield we did and what were the what are some of the results that you're finding with those combinations rich you want to take this one sure uh, yeah so we that was kind of interesting too so we expected the combination to be much worse than you know each one individually so we had like a it was a n95 mask we had that separate that we had the face shield and then, as you saw in one of the pictures, the combination, we had the face shield with the N95 mask. And it was kind of like in the middle in between the two. So there, um, I think the mask is kind of reducing some of the uh, 
we think the N95 is or N95 is reducing the fabric is reducing some of the resonance uh, problem that you get with just the face shield. Uh, so that's definitely something we would like to explore more. There, there are so many questions coming in. I'm not going to be able to keep up with all of them, but the next one is one of them is were there any tests at different levels of moisture saturation of the mass? You can tell how relevant this research is as everybody wants to. to yeah, I totally I totally just saw that from Andrew Schneider and I know Andrew. Um, yeah, that is frankly, that's a really good idea. Where were you in November? No, I'm kidding. Um, no, that's a that's a great idea. And um, when we get the hats back and we're doing the double mask, I think that's something that we should, you know, because once you have it all set up, you can test some things pretty easily. And I think uh, moisture saturation of the masks, uh, I think it's a great idea. Frankly, thank you for the idea. And if I if I think correctly, I think Andrew is an undergrad. And so maybe, Andrew, you might be able to get involved with us with the research. Um, because uh, we're we're always looking for good students. Great. Uh, I think that, uh, Dean Ferguson has his hand raised. Come on in. I'm permanently muted. I thought somebody had muted me permanently. So I noticed um, one one of the issues really with sound. You can hear me. One of the issues with sound and that is you can collect a massive amount of data really quickly. So I think part of what you showed on your presentation was sonograms as well, right? Where you're looking at, you know, frequency time. You're looking at frequency time and intensity or mm -hmm. that. So you can get a massive data set. And um, how do you analyze your data quickly and come out with something that's actually meaningful relative to the use of the relative to use of the mask and then also how would it teach us how to design masks that may remove some of the issues with the sound so if you're trying to optimize a, a mask so it was kind of a two-part question the complexity of measuring massive amount of data and then what may it teach you about creating a new type of mask Rich, are you going to take that? I, I guess with the, with the analyzing of the data, we use MATLAB, um, and so so that's good because with the MATLAB program, you can you know analyze a lot of data. That's actually one of the almost like the problem we have is we have already 130 files of data, and there's almost more data than there are you know hours to to look at it. So yeah. we need to be recruiting um, uh, more more students to help us, more faculty to help us. Um, and uh, and so if somebody's real interested in this area, uh, we could we could use the help because there's just there's a lot to look at. And on top of that, it's an evolving topic. Suddenly, it's double masking, and we didn't anticipate the double masking uh, when we initially collected the data. Um, Rich, did you want to um, comment on the design of masks? Yeah, well, That's we haven't gotten one. that. Uh to that level at, at this point. Meaning meaning that the design of the mask has a is another whole element within the research that's that's should, that is there to explore. Right. So right now we're trying to focus on the understand. We picked first the white noise testing, which is uh, very kind of statistically stable. It's a random noise. I think most people are familiar with white noise. Some people help play white noise to help them sleep at night. Uh, then we also have the speech files, which what Ian was talking about with the um, spectrograms or sonograms of the date. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yes. I have one. I, I've used this for bird song before. So there's things you can stick on iPads to do with this as well. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so with the artificial speech and the um, and, and the real speech files, we're going to be like Laura said, one thing we can use is MATLAB to help to evaluate the data. Um, I think we're we're getting into looking into um, probably uh, maybe partnering someone who 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 deals with large data, how to evaluate uh, mm -hmm. very large data. Um, we can also do with recordings, uh, do speech intelligibility testing, and that's something um, that we want to do. Carry this next step is to do a listening study. So with the recordings we have of the real speech uh, files. 
uh, we can do uh, listening studies to try to understand exactly, you know, how many syllables of the words or how many words are communicated. Uh, so do we, you know, is, are we seeing a, you know, is it like a 5% drop or is it, you know, a 20% drop? What, what is the, the actual loss in, in hearing and communication? And I had kind of two things. First, we so we collected white noise data. We collected um, artificial no, uh, artificial voice recordings and also real voice recordings from this head and torso simulator by Brule and Care. And the artificial, I just want to say, the artificial voice recording is kind of a trip. It sounds just like Charlie Brown's parents or Charlie Brown's teachers. Rah, 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 rah. You can't make out anything. So you would never do speech intelligibility with that or the white noise. But then it also has these speech files where we, um, I think we did the English female one and English male one. There's a whole bunch of different speech um, files. And from that, you could do speech intelligibility. Um, but just circling back for a second on the design of the mass, uh, I think it's important that we all, all um, re you know, realize that by far the most important thing is droplet transmission. Um, and so working, we, we want to make sure that we're always working within that as the primary goal of the mask. And as long as we have effective droplet transmission because nothing's more important than I've seen um, like people use the gators and we tested the gators and I've seen some video of people blowing out a birthday candle with a gator on and those are terrible at uh, droplet transmission but they were great for speech but we would never recommend a, a gator because even though it's great for speech the bigger issue here is droplet transmission and we always have mm -hmm. to keep that in mind. Yeah, I thank you, Laura. I think that's a really great point. Um, but 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 what's so incredible here is the 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 research opportunities here. It's it's limitless, and 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 so what do you need to be successful? Because you're racing against the clock. Because I'm sure there's a million other researchers out here who are out there who are doing similar types type of things. So what do you need? I think you know. Think big. What, what would you need to get your research done, just what you have now, and to get it out into, into the field before others? I'd like to buy a hat. We rented the hats last time, and doing the rental agreement and stuff, and then getting it was there's always some, some delay. I think it'd be great if we could buy a hat. That's a $30,000 piece of equipment. We were wondering um, you know, if we can find that money, or maybe we can get one used, because it really... I, I don't think it would would as long as it's still in obviously very good shape. You know, I don't think there's you know, if it has a little dent in the side of it, it's not going to affect the speech at all because that all comes from the head of the of the head and torso simulator. So I think if we could, you know. So there's money. It's kind of I think it's money and manpower. Yeah, Lance, what do you think about the um, equipment we would need for the listening study? Yeah, we'd also need to have um, some quality earphones that the participants would use, as well as some microphones that we'd be using in the listening study. Um, we could also think of another aspect and application of all this for the hearing impaired. And so we can expand it in so many areas, like Dr. Forster was saying. Um, I don't know if we have any development people on the call today. Uh, but if we do, I think that this is something that we should really think about going to our trustees and saying this is so timely. Uh, it would be really helpful to give you the resources that you need to be successful here. I think of this, I come from CDC and, and one of the things at CDC, we had our epi aids, right? We're, you know, there's a million epidemiologists across CDC, but when you have an outbreak, uh, you have to get those people, you have to take them off of whatever it is they normally do and you put them on the outbreak investigation. And I almost feel like that's, your research is so timely, um, but there is a window of opportunity that we need to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of questions coming in. I, I don't even know if I can, I don't, even know if I can keep up with them, but um, and I don't know um, if, if these are students or if these are faculty, but feel free to come in and ask questions too. I don't need to read them off of the um, the chats, but one question here is, would the headphones be noise canceling headphones? Hmm. I think I'm. 
We haven't decided that yet, but I mean, we could use a variety of headphones. Okay, that was off of what you said, Lance. I was, I didn't catch that. Um, uh, this is a question. Can you give a sample of a speech file that's used? I don't know how easy that is to do uh, where you're located or what you have on your computers in front of you. Rich, do you have that on your MacBook or is that on that lab Windows PC? Isn't you're there one on one drive? You're muted, Rich. We could get it off one drive. Rich, you're muted. I'll, pull it up. I'll see if I can pull it up here while someone else takes the next question. Okay. Phaedra, you're muted. Thank you. How many times have we said that to each other over the last year? <laughs> I, I, what I was saying was we have a whole list of questions that we prepare in advance, but I would much rather us go this natural route because it's, um, it's much more fun. Um, there's another question here. Would thermal expansion of the mask material caused by the wearer exhaling have an, any effect? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, it might. Um, yeah, so that's something. So that's something, um, Jordan, that we would, you know, that we if we used a real human subject, we would be able to have something, you know, like that. But the problem with the human subject is that they're not going to very re repeatedly say the same phrases. And so that is the that is why the head and torso simulator is um, is used in the field is for that repeatability. And um, and so, yeah, so there are going to be some things. I, I like the idea of adding moisture to the to the mask. We would have to. Uh, research how much moisture to add add to the mask. Um, I, I would think as a, as a percent or maybe as a weight. Um, but yeah, so the hats, the head and torso simulator, um, it so there are there are some disadvantages in that it is not a human speaking, but the advantage is that it's so repeatable. Rich, do you have the file yet? You're muted. Yes, yeah, so I, I found this is the artificial female speaker. OK, and there's nothing wrong with his microphone. That's how it really sounds. <laughs> so can you explain it? Because I have no idea what I just listened to. Well, it's kind of a combination of all the languages is a way that I, that I think you can answer. It really sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher, but what it actually is, it's a combination of all the languages. Um, Rich, do you have a one of the English ones that you could share? Is that handy? Yes, I do. Hang on, American English. Okay. So let's just say that on the, we didn't have this on the first day of testing, but on the second and third day of testing, we were all wearing earplugs because that like noise, that you know, artificial speech kept playing and it was kind of loud. And so we ended up wearing earplugs. But um, but the English uh, ones, you know, and it's good to get this artificial speech. There's a lot of data and these type of speech files have been um, developed uh, actually developed at the United Nations um, for because uh, United Nations does a lot of um, telecommunication standards. Do you have the uh, English one, Rich? Uh, yes, I do. So I found one of the English speech files. And right, so Laura said, um, through my experience uh, with working at Lucent Technologies and uh, being uh, involved in the inner, what's called the International Telecommunications Union, um, which is uh, part of it's a United Nations organization. But to come up with some set s standards for speech um, quality, they, you know, not everybody wants English, right? So people who speak German or Italian or French or, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, Jap Japanese um, and Mandarin, other languages, they, so they came up with kind of that synthesized one that's kind of a combination of different uh, sounds that you would get with multiple languages. Now, here's a standard English uh, 
test, uh, a real English speaker. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. Sickness kept him home the third week. The box will hold seven gifts at once. Jazz and swing fans like fast music. So you can see how it's sort of different sentences that don't really tell a whole story. So uh, it makes you have to work harder to understand, you know, all, all the words and syllables in, in, that, in those phrases. And looking at the faces of our students, Andrew Pierce and Anahita Hajimurazai. Andrew, do you want to comment on, like, was that part of your nightmares for the last several weeks? Because we listened to this over and over and over. Yes, I actually did hear those while attempting to go to sleep. It was so <laughs> repeated for us over and over and over, a few hundred times per session. So, yes. <laughs> That's the part of research that nobody tells you about, right? It's that monotony uh, that we we all have to go through <laughs> to, to get the results, yeah. um, but that's great. So, um, oh my gosh, I feel like you are, you're, you're racing against the clock yes. in getting your research out there, right? So you told us about this one paper that you're 80% done and, but um, so what are your next steps? Uh, because you collected a lot of data and so this paper that you're working on is just one piece of it. What do you see your next six to 12 months being in this in this area? In, in an ideal world. OK, so we have dissemination. And at the same time, I really think we urgently need to get the head and torso simulator back, either renting or buying either way. Get it back. I really think we need to get that double mask um, data. I would like to be the first to uh, publish that double mask data. I, I think the double mask data um, kind of jumps in priority uh, uh, clearly with what the CF, uh, CDC is saying. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, double masking for a lot of people is from a speech standpoint almost, almost impossible. Um, and so we need to see uh, like how bad is it? And if we get the publishing out there, maybe we can tell people, OK, it's not as bad as you think it is. It, you know, or um, different ways also that we could amplify sound um, so that to make up for the double mask. Um, what do you anything Lance and Rich that I'm missing? Well, I would really like for us to be able to procure a hat so we can do the listening study that would take, you know, the most time getting volunteers. And I think that to me is the most exciting because we're always thinking about how we can apply our research to pedagogy. And I just think it would be really informative and helpful, not just for us locally, but across the globe. And not just in K-12 and college education, but so many applications the listening study could provide. Right. Well, your dean is here, so perhaps um, he'll be able to find something for you. <laughs> no, I'm putting you on the spot there, Ian, sorry. Oh, I wanted to say. Uh, um, I'm always happy. I'm always happy to help. I'm I good at analyzing data, <laughs> especially when it has a dollar sign in front of it. <laughs> but you know, yeah, so we're gonna sell, we're gonna sell. We're planning um, right now. We're submitting a, an abstract. Um, it's for the Acoustical Society of America. It's it's one I've been a member of for 25 years, and um, so they're having a virtual conference in June, and we want to focus that talk would be on the um, classroom effect, uh, some of the classroom uh, acoustic effects and the differences between the close talking data, which we're publishing, um, we're, we're submitting for a journal publication, and then also the farther distance um, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're working right now with Danny. Danny's with us today. He's um, a student who's currently working with us and um, he's working on the six meter out. So so the data that we are analyzing that we um, <clears throat> haven't had a chance yet to look at the results, but Danny's doing a great job of um, of you of analyzing the data. And so that'll be um, that we'll probably actually have a couple of different topics for the ASA conference. Um, uh, that we will propose um, uh, for the conference, um, but I'm sure that you know there will be a lot of competition in that. ASA is is really the the gold standard in acoustics, the Acoustical Society of America. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a uh, hand raise raised, Elizabeth. 
Hi, uh, I was just so wondering you, um, if uh, I think I asked this before, but so you, what you would you be willing to test for different voices, so like different if, voices of different ages? Males, right? mm. And you have to make sure. Yeah, voices of okay. different uh, ages. Just, just one second, Laura, before you answer, um, if you are not speaking, please mute yeah. your mic. Um, uh, sorry about that, Laura. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so different ages. Uh, yeah, you know, there are a lot of these uh, standard files that have already been developed. Um, and uh, as Rich was saying, by the United Nations International Telecommunications Union. So we would probably stick to those. And um, I would imagine that they already have some that are would simulate other ages. What do you think, Rich? Because I know there's a lot of different files of speech that we can choose from. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could also, I guess if we want to look at other ages, it would almost be the reverse. We could go from student back to teacher, you know, the other way, because there's also that communication. You know, communication is not all one direction. It's not just a, a lecturer and no questions and no discussion or no input from the students. Well, it is in my class. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. And also, Lance, don't you think that we could include this in the listening study? Absolutely. And that, that reminds me, too, I have so many times I have to ask my students, could you repeat what you said? Because I couldn't hear them. You know, it's muffled and they might be more than six meters away. Yeah. I, I think this line of research has so many permutations. It's almost just like, I, I don't know, you probably just your head could spin just thinking mm -hmm. about I could go down this path or this path. And it's almost just, you know, finding a path, getting it out there, and then just seeing what other people are doing and just jumping off from there. It's it's really, really interesting. Um, other questions? There's a ton of questions that have come in, um, but are there any that you see that you'd like to address? Um, I'll just go with the most recent one because I can't scroll backwards very well. So this one's from Mark Guile in Wellstar College. It says, you mentioned possible resonance with the amplification and face shields, which must be material dependent. I wonder if certain materials might actually amplify sounds in a good way. Great question, Mark. Question. No, that's a good question. And that's something we... Uh, we, we need to do more with the speech data to understand if this amplification uh, for some 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 words or phrases or for some speakers, it might actually be beneficial. Uh, but we have a feeling it's going to be kind of because it amplifies a thousand hertz, but then at 2000, 4000 hertz, those sounds are way, way down. Uh, we have a feeling it's it's going to be worse um, than. Um, than, than the benefit of amplifying. And I can also imagine, are you, I'm, I imagine that people are starting to publish in this area. So are you, are you, you know, fast and furiously trying to keep up with what's coming out to see, you know, how you're in alignment or in a different path? I mean, what what's out there so far in this area? Well, so yeah. The the publications, but we're doing what we've seen is actually different and also that we've evaluated uh, a much larger number of different masks and shield combinations. Um, some publications that are out there, it might just be, you like know, three. one or two different um, face masks uh, where we have a larger number and also we're doing it with the head and torso simulator. Uh, and, and so we think we're on a similar but different path than other researchers um, in this area. And also there is more data coming out on droplet transmission. Um, one, one of the things that inspired this work in addition to, um, to our friend's daughter, Emma, was also uh, Duke came out with a really well-published, um, well-publicized, well-written study about droplet transmission. Since then, there's been a lot more studies on droplet transmission. So we are um, expanding, so we're not just looking at the acoustics compared to the Duke study, but the acoustics compared to other studies on droplet transmission, um, because there, there have been many. One of the complications is that uh, we tried to get 
we tried to get the exact same masks that were used in the Duke study, but a lot of these cloth masks, they really vary. Um, they vary in the the weave, the ver they vary in the material, they vary in the thickness, they vary in the number of layers. And and so it, it's been hard to do a, um, a, a one on one comparison with some of the cloth masks with droplet transmission, but we can certainly do that with the um, the other. But yeah, you know, we saw this big study. This big study came out in acoustics, and it was only three masks, and we have thirteen combinations of masks and and sounds. And so, um, so ours, I I think our study is a bit different um, than some of the ones that have been published to date. But we're absolutely keeping on track of it. Great. Um, honestly, I can't think of a topic that we've had that is more research relevant than what you all are doing right now. It's really, really exciting. This hour has flown by. <laughs> I think that tells you how much people are really interested in this topic. There are multiple questions and comments that came in that I didn't get a chance to um, to respond to or to ask you about, but please feel free when this is over to, to respond. Um, good questions like um, different types of materials, different types of mass, et cetera. Um, but anyway, just I want to thank you all, the three of you very, very much and your students too for participating. This is <laughs> terribly fascinating. I could um, stay on for another hour, if, um, which we can do, but I'm, <laughs> we'll do that another time. So thank you very much for um, for for launching our research with relevant show in such a, such an insightful way. I really appreciate it. Um, so we are all out of time. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating and a reminder that to tune in to next time, uh, you can find out what our schedule is for our um, for our research with relevant shows by going to our website. Um, and I'm reading the notes that Joelle has for me. Uh, the February 26th show, which is our next time that we'll be meeting, will be um, featuring Farouk Hossein. He is an assistant professor of construction management very excited to have um, to have that group. I think this will be the first time that they're participating in our research with relevant shows, so we're excited about that. And he will be discussing how his industry experience has influenced his research on global sustainability. Wonderful topic. Um, so until then, I want to thank you, Laura, Rich, and Lance so much for your time today and your students. Uh, you're awesome. We love our KSU students. You all have a wonderful weekend and we will see you in a couple couple more weeks with Research with Relevance. Thank, thank you, you all. so much for, you. for all your support. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. And also thanks to Joelle and Tom um, yep. for all their help with putting um, you know, the script, the video, the production. We Office of Research has a great opportunity. Team. Yeah. Well, you know what? Thank you, Rich. And I should have thanked my own staff and I forgot. So, <laughs> so thank you for doing that for me. I'm going to get in trouble for not doing that. <laughs> I hope I didn't miss anybody. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole crew here. So, uh, but thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.